Our reading is from the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 6, verses 14 to 18. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Thank you, Murray. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we give thanks for your word. And we pray this morning that our hearts and minds would be open to hear uh, what you would say through it to us. Amen. Good morning, all. Um, so, over the last uh, six weeks, we have been looking at creation, and that uh, particularly the first three chapters of Genesis. Um, and we finished that last week, so if that was something you're interested in, you missed it. Um, it is, the, the uh, recordings of those talks are online on the uh, YouTube uh, page, so you can have a look at them if you like. Uh, but really, um, if you don't fancy watching the entirety of those six weeks, they can be summed up quite simply. And that is that God in creation was building a garden temple because his desire was to dwell in the midst of his people. Uh, and then we see that actually echoed later when Moses leads the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And 50 days after that first Passover, uh, the people find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai. And the presence of God uh, hovers over the mountaintop in a cloud. God calls Moses up the mountain and he makes him sit for six days just staring at the cloud, waiting for something to happen. Uh, another six days, just deliberately echoing, really, I think, from God, that he is resetting creation. That where it went wrong before, this is now, we're redoing something. Six days, and then he gives to Moses uh, the commandments. They're carved onto stone, and God sets a covenant with his people, a promise with his people, where both sides have things that they will do, uh, and they will walk together. And the people then are given precise instructions on how to build a tabernacle, which is basically a tent, uh, a tent at the center of this nomadic nation. And as they walk around the wilderness, wherever they go, the first thing they do is they build this tabernacle in the center. And then uh, when they move on, the first thing they do is they kind of unwrap as a nation and they pull it all down and they carry it off and start again. The Israelites uh, then, once the tabernacle uh, has been built, see the presence of God coming down in answer to that promise uh, that he would dwell among his people. God's intention from the beginning of time that he would uh, dwell with us. Not far off, but come and be among us. So the Israelites then build a sacred box the Ark of the Covenant. If you've uh, watched the Indiana Jones film, you will have a rough idea what we're talking about now. Um, and uh, into that box, they put the stone tablets with the law written on them. And on the top of it, uh, they put a lid known as the caparet, which is known in English as the mercy seat, uh, that at either end of it with a statue um, of uh, a cherubim, a fearsome angel guarding either end, which again echoes uh, the uh, story of the Garden of Eden when the people leave, uh, when Adam and Eve leave that garden, God sets two cherubim, fierce warriors at the gate to the garden. 
Uh, this ark sat in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred space within that tabernacle tent. But when the Israelites eventually settled the land, the tabernacle disappeared and the ark alone became synonymous with God's presence. Where it was, they believed God was. It was kept in various houses and in other places. And when things were tough, they would pull it out and it would go before them. And when they went into battle, they would take this box with them because they believed, therefore, that God was with them in their fight. And when times were good, they forgot about it and they neglected it and they left it in whoever's house was nearest. And uh, even at times, they left it with their enemies who would look after it for a while and be blessed by it being around them or otherwise. But then nearly 500 years after Moses, we get to the reading that we had this morning. Um, 2 Samuel 5 says this, David, this is King David who killed Goliath. Uh, David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. This weird thing happens that he's part king. He gets anointed as king, but he doesn't take it all up straight away. Uh, he finds himself initially with a base in Hebron, and that's because the previous king, King Saul, his son, Ishbosheth, fantastic name, uh, he claims the northern kingdom for himself, the northern kingdom, Israel. And he refuses to accept uh, King David as king, even though the people of Israel want it to happen. So seven and a half years go past where David knows that God has anointed him king over both kingdoms. He doesn't seek to overthrow Saul's son, Ishbosheth. Shall we all say that together? Ishbosheth. It's great, isn't it? Ishbosheth. But he waits on God's timing. He doesn't force the promise that God has given into an early uh, happening. But seven and a half years waiting, planning, strategizing over what kind of king he will be, what kind of kingdom he will rule. So when finally Ishbosheth dies and the two kingdoms are united under David's rule, the first thing that David does is he marches his army into Jerusalem to announce it as his capital city. And then he gathers 30,000 men for a victory parade into the city as the new king of all Judah and Israel. A mighty army entering for a coronation that David must have been planning for seven and a half years. A triumphal entry he has been imagining and picturing and waiting for. Now, they say that in politics, the first 100 days are where you have to get things done. Next uh, November, we will have perhaps a new president, perhaps a replacement president in America. We might have a new prime minister in this nation. And they will, no doubt, uh, trot out this idea they have 100 days a hundred days to bring the change you want to see, to establish the leadership that you want, your program for the future. And David has been planning seven and a half years. Picture the scene. The city will have heard this parade coming. 30,000 singing a song that David himself has composed for this event. And we know what that song is. It's Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. David has been waiting to be king seven and a half years to come into the fullness 
of it. And he writes a song which announces that he actually is not the king. In case we missed it, he repeats it again. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Not David, but God. And 2 Samuel 6 tells us, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. David, who has conquered all before him, he is the mighty warrior of Israel. He's heading in as the king. Can you imagine the expectation that everyone would have? He's going to raise the army. He's going to conquer all of our enemies. He will drive them out before us. But he chooses not to wear great armor, not riding a great stallion in a show of power. In fact, in a coronation like this, you would expect um, the army, the musicians, the captured, the conquered, the booty from various battles to be paraded in first. And the climax, right at the back, the arrival of the great float or carriage, carrying in a, a huge throne with the mighty king sitting on top of it. But we're told that here, David is at the front of the parade, dancing in a linen ephod, the clothes of a priest, not a king, not a a general in their army, in their armor. And it's not even the fine tunic of a priest, but it's the simple linen ephod. If you remember the coronation, from King Charles being crowned. Do you remember the moment when they put the screens up? And just before they anointed him in a way that we weren't able to see, what they did? They took off all of the paraphernalia, the finery, and left him standing in a linen tunic. That's where this comes from. The simple linen ephod is in fact the priest's undergarment. So after seven and a half years of planning, the victorious, triumphant King David chooses to lead the parade dancing in his underwear. Quite literally, dancing in his underwear. He is leading the singing, the celebration, with all his might. But what then had the place of honor? at the back of the parade. The Ark of the Covenant. Not dragged out because there was a battle to be won. The symbol of the presence of God had prime place. After seven and a half years, victorious David establishes his kingdom with his first act to be a fool in praise of God, and to establish the presence of God in the center of the city in a tent that he had prepared for the very purpose. The scripture goes on to tell us uh, how it was set up, the amount of people that he employed as uh, Levites to to work through it, um, as those who uh, kind of looked after it. And basically, it was millions of pounds a week he spent on this. He emptied Uh, the nation's coffers to establish worship and praise and the presence of God at the heart of his capital city. Having had years to plan and strategize, to plot, to design, David chooses to do one single thing, and that is to set prayer and worship at the center of his kingdom, to establish it under the rule and reign of the one true divine king, the Lord Almighty. 24-7 prayer and worship. That was his answer. That was his message. 
Whatever else we may do, he declares, first we will make a place for the presence of God to tabernacle with us. If you read the start of John's gospel, that first chapter in John's gospel, it says, he became one of us and he literally, in the Greek, tabernacled among us. Just a tent, not a fancy temple. That was all that God needed to dwell and live there. So for 33 years more beyond that time, whatever else happened, the tabernacle fixed intimacy with God at the center of David's political, social, royal planning. The heart of his first 100 days, the next 100 days, and every 100 days afterwards. The presence of God. And the weird thing is that, that um, later on, when they build the temple, the temple becomes this kind of segmented thing. If you're this, you can get this close to it. If you're this, you can get a little bit closer. If you're this, you get a little bit closer still. But theologians argue that this 33-year period is the only period in Israel's history where everybody had access. Everybody could go into the tent. Men, women, children, foreigners, everybody. Because if the king could dance around in his underwear and sing praise, then nobody was above it. Everybody could go. And from that presence, a remarkable thing happened. David spent all the coffers of the kingdom on prayer and worship. And what happened was the most remarkable time of peace, of prosperity, of social justice, all sorts of voices of the prophets raised up to bring change and care for those who didn't have. Now, let's not make the mistake of thinking that this means that if we get our worship right in some way, if we have the right style, if it's good enough, slick enough, long enough, loud enough, then somehow we unlock the blessings of God. That's the mistake that so many in the church make. They think that if we somehow get things right, our theology right, then we get a special thing going on with us. God's presence is pure grace. He does it because it's what God does, not because somehow we are good and proper and sorted. It's not about excellence in performance or being correct in practice. This is simply about the genuine desire to begin by making space for God's presence in our church, in our homes, in our lives. Jonathan Aitken, um, the disgraced ex-Tory MP, uh, he uh, ended up um, becoming a vicar. He's now a prison chaplain. And he um, compared his early relationship with God to that of a bank manager. He said this, um, I spoke to him politely, visited his premises intermittently, occasionally asked him for a small favor or overdraft to get myself out of difficulty, thanked him condescendingly for his assistance, kept up the appearance of being one of his reasonably reliable customers, and maintained a superficial contact with him on the grounds that one of these days he might come in useful. But C.S. Lewis who wrote the Narnia books, he said this, he said, the prayer preceding all prayers is, may it be the real I who speaks, may it be the real thou that I speak to. And that's really all that David is doing. He says, the beginning, the end of all things, Honesty and integrity before God, not pretending to be anything other than what I am. And a desire to seek after the one true God that might be there. Let's pray.
Lord God. Please save us from pretending. Pretending that we are more fixed than we are, that we're cleverer than we are, that we're more important than we are. We know that we are precious in your eyes and you love us dearly, irrespective of what we carry, what we bring. I'm going to pray this morning that we would make space for you, that we would set you at the center of our lives, of our desires. And that in doing that, you would raise up a people who would be peacemakers, healers, justice warriors, that from us would flow love and mercy and grace. Amen. I'm going to invite the band to come up and they'll lead us in a song. And if you'd like, gather up whatever out of that uh, talk was useful and helpful and maybe talk to God about it. So if you would like, please stand uh, if you're able and we will sing.